Well, tonight we're going to continue with our study in the book of Acts. It's good to have everyone on Facebook, and uh, we pray that the, the Holy Spirit was present as we were worshiping the Lord wherever you are tonight. Or in the morning, because different parts of the world are listening in, and sometimes it's morning and sometimes it's night. And so we thank God for our Facebook friends. God bless you, and uh, continue to uh, uh, tune in to us. And uh, we're excited about what God's doing. God's getting everything ready for a greater outreach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise God. If you have your Bibles, please open up to the book of Acts, chapter 20. And we're going to start at verse 31, but I want to just digress for a moment a little bit back into uh, verse 28. Uh, because this is something important that we all need to really just uh, see, and um, we need to uh, understand what's, what the Apostle Paul is uh, instructing us here. Verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Notice it didn't say committee. Notice it didn't say church uh, voting. It didn't say uh, anything of such. It says that the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Hallelujah. The Bible says, who the Holy Ghost hath made overseers. No one else. If you don't have the calling of God, if you don't have God instructing you to be in leadership, then guess what? Then you're, you're not really in the leadership that God has for you. You need to pray and ask the Lord where he would have you to be. It's always important to know that the Holy Ghost has to make you uh, to that place that he has for you in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? And he says this, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We need to feed the people of God. We need to make sure that they're getting fed the word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, and I remember my mother telling me a story about my brother, there was a certain vegetable my brother hated. He didn't like to eat. And my father used to make us eat everything that was in our plates. If we didn't eat, we couldn't get up. How many went through that? Okay. Well, you know what I'm talking about, okay? But what my brother used to do, and what he did this one time, is uh, when my parents weren't looking, I guess he would take the vegetables and he stuck them in my father's slipper. And he just kept stuffing that slipper with these, with these things that he didn't like. Well, my father, of course, went to put his slippers on, and you know what happened after that don't have to get into that. But how many know that sometimes we have to eat something that's not good for us? I'm, well, I mean, it's good for us, but we don't like it. That's what I should say. You know, sometimes we don't like certain things, but we have to have that diet. We have to have that nutrition. And sometimes, you know, we put up a fight, right? You know, uh, you kids, you know what I'm talking about. Mama makes something, and boy, daddy makes something. He's not used to making it. And, you know, boy, man, that's terrible. You know, and, but, uh, you know, you've got to eat it. And so sometimes when a, when a preacher is preaching and he's preaching what's gone God's heart, sometimes it may not sit well with you, but you know what? God knows what you have need of, and that will feed you because it needs to feed you those things sometimes that don't seem so pleasant tasting at times. Amen? So if you are in a church and all you hear is uh, cookies and, and Twinkies and sweet stuff, you don't belong there. They're not doing you justice. It's not about making you feel good. That's not what ministry is about. Ministry is giving you and feeding you the word of God so that when you're out on your own, you can stand upon the word of God. Amen? That You know this word inside and out, that you can stand in the midst of a storm. You can stand in the midst of criticism. You can stand in the midst of people ridiculing you and mocking you. You'll be able to stand against the world tides of the enemy coming against you. And uh, sometimes the sweet stuff doesn't last. Amen? Praise God. Although I like sweet. You know, Annie makes a mean raspberry uh, tiramisu, I'll tell you. Uh, but you wouldn't like it, though. I know that. I'll just keep that to myself. Praise God. And then in verse 29, he says this, For I know 
this. This is not something that the Apostle Paul was kind of not sure of. Uh, maybe it would happen, maybe it won't happen. He says, no, I know this will happen. And he knows it will happen because of his past experiences. And when you're in the ministry, sometimes young people, they, they, especially young pastors, they take it for granted. They, they think that sometimes us guys that have been in the ministry for a long time, we're old-fashioned and stuff like that. It's not that. We have tremendous amount of experience that they, don't even, they haven't even touched yet. You know, they may be better preachers or better, better singers or whatever they may be, but they don't have the wisdom and the, and the, and the knowledge uh, of ministry, practical ministry, as we do when we have suffered and we've gone through the trials and the tribulations and we've gone through the, uh, the birthing of, the, of a ministry and we've gone through the growing process and the adolescence of the ministry and we've gone through the, the heartaches of the ministry and we've gone through the, the times of trials and testings and wanting to give up and, and, and turn, our, uh, you know, turn away. And so all of those things, they haven't really gone into a lot of those things. But as we are getting older, we're getting better. Hallelujah. And I, I believe that. I'm not just getting older, I'm getting better. I'm getting more right. Hallelujah. Praise God. But he says, for I know this. I know this. Nobody can tell me any different. I know this. That after my departing, when he leaves, and understand now, the Apostle Paul had such a, a calling from God to establish these churches on, on the on the principles of the foundation of Christ being the chief cornerstone and, the, the, uh, of course, the, the uh, you know, foundation of the apostles and prophets, as he says in the scriptures. His heart was to see these churches established in truth and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And he says, I know that after my departing, I know when I leave here. And his mission after leaving here was to go to a few places, but they end up in Jerusalem. And we know that when he ended up in Jerusalem, the Jews were waiting there to capture him and send him to Rome. And he would be uh, executed with, by having his head cut off. That's something to look forward to, huh? He knew that was going to happen. He knew that was going to be, he was going to be a martyr. And yet he, he didn't turn away from that. He wasn't persuaded away from that. He determined that he was going to go to Jerusalem. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I want you to understand that if the Apostle Paul thought that Christianity wasn't real, that it was just a, an emotional, make-believe thing, why would he want to go to a place that he knew was going to kill him for it if it wasn't true? Amen. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, let me ask you a question. You're here in church. Let's pretend you're a sheep. You're a little sheep. Bah, you're a sheep. Bah, you're a sheep. Sheep know wolves, don't they? When the wolf comes in the pack, they know who a wolf is, right? What? Why wouldn't they be able to discern the wolf? Ah, well, let's look at Matthew 7.15 for a moment. Let's look at Matthew 7.15. Jesus, when he was with the disciples, he gave an instruction. And the instruction that he gave is this. He said, beware. Say beware. That means pay attention. Look sharp. Take notice of false prophets what are prophets? Prophets are those who come saying, thus saith the Lord. They come representing God. They come representing the Lord. They come representing truth, supposedly. But here he says, beware of false prophets. Those that are going to, it's called pseudo-prophets. Those who are going to come, and they're going to say they're from God, but they're not. And look what he says. Which come to you in what? Ah, there we go. Comes to you in sheep's clothing. So if you're a sheep and you see another sheep come in and you're not sure, but you can't really tell because he's got a sheepskin over him. It looks like a sheep, sounds like a sheep, talks like a sheep, smells like a sheep. 
You know, that's why the expression, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, most likely it's a duck. That can be true, but that can be false. Especially when you have someone coming into the church who says they're a representative of God, speaking on behalf of God, and they're teaching things contrary to the things of God. That's why it is my position as the leader and the senior pastor of this church to make sure that doctrinally we're correct. At, and there's no expense to that. We have to make sure that we're doctrinally sound. If we're not doctrinally sound, then something's wrong. And if somebody comes in with a different sound, and I've been very proud of you all because I know at times when some have come in, you know, in the past, and have spoken things, that little bell went off. And uh, you approached me and said, Pastor, that didn't sound right. Can you explain that? And, uh, and I'm glad that you do that because uh, that means I'm doing my job. And uh, you do that with me too. If I say something that doesn't sound right, you come to me and ask me. Say, Pastor, you said something. I don't, think that, I don't know if that's right. I, I, can you explain it to me? I will. But here Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravening wolves. What, is a, what does a wolf want to do? It wants to consume the sheep. Okay. So Paul is using that analogy. He's saying to you, uh, in going back to uh, Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 30, I mean verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, their only concern, uh, their only concern in ministry is self gradation they want to lift up self. They don't care about the flock. They don't care about splitting the flock. They don't care about any of that stuff. All they care about is them being in the limelight. And you can tell those that want to be in the limelight. So he says, beware of them. Take notice of them. And then he goes on in verse 30, and he makes another observation. Maybe because while he was there in ministry, he saw some of, that, some of that spirit rising up. Maybe it wasn't at the forefront. And I'm only speculating here, but you know, I, I'm kind of thinking that maybe he saw something there. Otherwise, how would he know that also of your own selves? So he probably saw there was some that were in leadership that were you know, more interested in their ministry than the ministry that God had called that particular church to. And he says, for also of your own selves shall men arise. They're going to want the forefront. They're going to want to come up front. They're going to want the pulpit. Believe me, let me tell you something. We've been doing this for almost 20 years. And can you imagine how many sermons have gone through this pulpit? And you say, Pastor, how can you do that? I, I think I counted it was almost uh, almost uh, almost. I think with Wednesday and Sunday, almost 2,000 sermons. That's a lot of sermons. But again, speaking perverse things, things that are contrary to what you have learned. You know, there's, there's so much uh, dissension in the body of Christ today. And when I talk to pastors, you know, I, some of the pastors that sometimes they have a, a, a conception of, you know, it really doesn't matter doctrinally as long as we all are get together, and that's not true. We have to remain doctrinally right. Otherwise, you know, that's why the Bible says, uh, in you know, enduring the, you know, continue in the faith, you know, keep continuing, keep continuing in the faith. Don't move away from the hope of the gospel. Don't move away from those things. You know, earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Contending is a fighting word. Contending. Earnestly contending for the faith. That's in John. Uh, for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. So, you know, that's why some, some, I can't understand some pastors just saying that it doesn't matter what you believe. I, I heard that one time when, when my wife was confronting somebody at one of the ministers of a church. And he said, oh, we don't tell people what to believe. They just come and they can believe what they want. I'm like, really? Can you imagine how many different thoughts, how many different doctrines go on? And he says, speaking perverse things for one purpose only, one and one purpose only, to draw away disciples after themselves. 
They want to draw the disciples away from themselves. If you want to see a story about that, that shows so, uh, shows, so, it's a sad story, but it shows the very same thing happened is with David and Absalom. Absalom wanted to be king, and he wanted to kill his own father. Think about that. How he and, and how he did it was, the Bible says that he began to win the hearts of the people. He began to win, you know, and when they came and they didn't like what, what David judged, he said, oh, but if I was a judge, you know, if I was doing this, if I was in power, if I was doing this, I would do this different. How, haven't we heard that before? You know, like they know better. What their way is better. And, and they, they would be more on the people's side. And that's what Absalom did. And Absalom won the hearts of the people. And David had to flee. He had to run. But then God, who called David, got on the scene. And you know what happened to Absalom after that. So, um, in fact, uh, David was so heartbroken that, uh, you know, that his uh, captain of the host wanted to kill him. And, and he, you know, he was in such disarray that the guy told him, said, David, we're putting our life on the line for you. And if we come back, if you're like this, we're going to kill you too. You know, come on. We're, we're, you know, what's right is right. Now you're, you're telling us, no, 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 no. No, this has to be done. So Paul says that. He says, I know this after my departing. Grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And then he says this. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Based on what's previously said, right? Watch. 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 Watch what I'm telling you. Watch that there will be men among you that will rise up. Watch. There are going to be men coming in, he said. There's going to be this. Grievous wolves will come in. Watch for them. Watch for these signs. You'll see them. Anyone that comes into a ministry and they're here and they visit and, oh, they love it, they want to be here, and then the next week they want to be in leadership, something's wrong. Say, no, no, let's wait 30, 60, 90 days. Let's see if the vision of the church is what you really have. If that's your vision. If you want to be a part of this vision, if you feel that you can function in this vision, let, let your gifts make room for you like the Bible says. See, there's wisdom. We have to apply that, okay? Now, I'm not talking about being on the worship team or on Sunday school. That's, that's a little bit different. But I'm talking about being in leadership where you're teaching doctrinal issues and being in leadership to uh, lead and guide people and counsel them. So he says here, therefore, watch and remember. Watching is something that's going to happen in the future or in the present. Remember is something that was given to them before. Remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night with tears. So not only is he telling you to watch for the present and watch for the future, but he's also saying, remember what I taught you. Remember? Well, how, how are they going to know the difference? Well, they're going to have to know the difference because he taught them well. He taught them sound doctrine. Amen? So because of that, now they are able to watch and they're able to make sure that their present and their future is in line with God's word. Amen? So he said, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And he says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God. He's getting ready to leave. He says, I've, can't, I've done my best. I've done everything I needed to do. I've set all the things in order that needed to be set. Now it's up to you to maintain and keep going with what I've given you. Amen? Thank you. And now, brethren, I commend you to God 
and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. If you're down, get a hold of God's grace and He'll build you up. Get a hold of God and it'll be, He'll build you up. And to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Hallelujah. He said, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Boy, I wonder how many people can say that. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities. What does that mean? Well, see, the Apostle Paul, he had all the saints give him money, 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 money. No. There were times when Paul had need and the churches didn't come through for him. And he had to work with his hands. He was a tent maker. He had to, at times, do some work. And see, a lot of times, pastors and ministers, they don't want to go get a secular job and, and work. They want God's people to do it. And when God's people can do it, they should do it. The Bible says, honor those with honor that is due. Okay, But if, if, it, if it's a thing that you don't want to take money from the church uh, to meet your needs because there's other important things going on, then you should try to get a little part-time job. Do that. And I've done that. I got a little part-time job. I'm a security guard at the New Bedford Yacht Club. Two nights a week, seven at night to one in the morning. Doesn't interfere with anything that I do as far as chaplain or anything like that or uh, or the church as a pastor has nothing to do with that. Um, I can come and go. I can lock up stuff if I had to, if I had an emergency. So that's not the issue. So it's, it's great. Works gives me a little bit of extra money that I can have, and it's not a burden on the church. I could take it from the church, but if I take it from the church, guess what? Missions is going to suffer. Okay, That's about another $600 a month. And I don't want to take that from the church. I want to be able to keep our mission promises that we made to our missionaries in India and also in, in Pakistan. So again, we, I'm, I'm working with my hands, you know, and I'm going and I'm doing. And the Apostle Paul did the same thing when he had to do that. He said, I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. Sometimes, you know, we, God blesses us with, uh, with better jobs, more money. It's not to hoard it for ourselves. Sometimes it's to bless others that don't have. Amen. Sometimes it's, it's to, to give a little offering to somebody, a little what I call the old Pentecostal handshake. And some of you that are old in the Lord, you know that. The old uh, Pentecostal handshake, you just give somebody, and that sometimes blesses people. He says, I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen? So when you give, you don't give with the expectation of getting something back. That's why the seed faith stuff doesn't work. Now, I'm not saying that you can't give, and God will give back to you, but you don't have to expect it. Aren't you glad when somebody gives you something, not because they, they, you're, you're, they're expected to do it, but they just do it off the cuff and do it? Doesn't it mean so much more? You know what I mean? Like Mother's Day, you give flowers. Okay, you know, don't just expect a chocolates on Valentine's Day or whatever. That's expected. But right out of the blue, you just go and you do something nice for somebody. And they say, hey, what's this for? Just to show you that I love you. It means a lot more than just And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. Hallelujah. Sometimes kneeling is necessary. It's an act of submission. And he prayed with them, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. You know why? Because they knew this would be the last time they saw him. They knew that going into this place that he was going would be the place where he would lose his life and he would be taken from them and they'd never see him again. Just think about that.
sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. That must have been a very emotional thing. You know? If I... Don't forget, remember that he was... Told by Jesus when he appeared to him, he says, He's going to show him how many how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul was going to suffer. That was his ministry. That's what he he longed to fulfill the will of God, even if it meant suffering. He's the one that wrote, for I, you know, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Because he knew that whatever God's will was for his life, even to that point of wanting to give his life up for Christ, that he wouldn't run from it, he wouldn't hide from it, that he was willing to pay the price. You need to see how important it is to do God's will for your life and not to, uh, not to be swayed by circumstances. Chapter 21, and it came to pass that after we were gone from there and we had launched, we came with a straight course unto Kus, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara, and finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. So now he's on his missionary journey, he's traveling, and remember, it's not like it is here today. When they traveled back then, it was like one to another, to an, one shot journey to another shot journey to another shot journey to another shot journey to another shot journey. Unless you go by bus. If everyone's ever gone by bus, that's the most horrible way to travel back then. And so he had all those, all those different ways. So now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and, and sailed into Syria. And landed at Tyra, for there the ship was to uh, unlade her burden. In other words, they were unloading the ship and bringing the supplies that were needed there. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So here now, the timing was off. It seems like a contradiction. One minute, God's telling them he's going to go to Jerusalem and die. Here, he's just saying by through the Spirit, Paul, they were saying he should not go up to Jerusalem. I believe this was just a delay because Paul was, you know, Paul was a caloric by any personality type. Paul, let's get it done. That's him. Let's get it done. We're going to go there. We're going to just plow right through. We're going to get it done. And sometimes a person with that strong personality trait has to have someone to pull the brakes a little bit because they're, they're very headstrong. And so um, Paul was that way. And so the Holy Spirit said, you know what? I'm going to tell him this ain't the right time to go up to Jerusalem. You've got a couple more things to do before you get there. Amen? So anyway, that's what I believe. And when we had accom uh, accomplished those days, notice that, verse 5. And when we had accomplished those days, there was something that needed to be done. We departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till, till we uh, were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Isn't that wonderful? They prayed. They knelt down. They weren't afraid. They weren't ashamed before all the people in the community. They were not ashamed. They got down, and they knelt, and they prayed. And when... We had taken our leave, one of another. We took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren to bow there with them for one day. And the next day we were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist and with one of the seven and abode with him. And the same night, oh, I'm sorry, and the same man 
He had four daughters. Virgins, which did prophesy. Uh, prophesy. Now, let me uh, say this about prophecy. Joel says that in the last days, your daughters, sons and daughters shall prophesy. So there's no problem with prophecy. I don't have a problem with a woman giving a prophecy. We've had women give prophecy in our church. That does not mean, however, that a woman is called to be a prophet. And we're going to see that in the scriptures. Many women are going around claiming to be a prophet. God never instituted that for a woman's ministry, to be a prophet. There's none in the Bible. There's prophetess, meaning in the Old Testament time, they were married to prophets. Read it. That was like a signature of being married to a prophetess. But they didn't have an ongoing prophetic ministry because they may have prophesied once, but they never prophesied again after that. So you have to understand that. And you're going to see that very clearly here. Listen to this. So they, 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 would, they did prophesy, right? Everyone agree that? They prophesied. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet. Now, wait a minute. If the women were prophets, why didn't God just use them? Right? I mean, you got three, you got four prophets right there. If they're prophets, they prophesy. Why didn't God just use them? Instead, it says... And as they tarried there many days, it came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, and he bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. What do you see different here? Do you see anything different here? When he spoke. Huh? But what's different? No. What did the old time prophets say? Thus saith the Lord. Why did they say that? In the Old Testament time, when a prophet spoke, they were the actual mouthpiece of God. They were actually speaking the word of God. So I say, thus saith the Lord, meaning that they were giving, the, the next thing that was coming out of their mouth was from God. Now, here's the difference. Now, in the New Testament, we have prophets, but not like that. Okay. Because the Bible says that Jesus... In, well, let me put it this way. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So you had the Old Testament prophets saying, thus saith the Lord, and then the words would come, and they, that was God speaking. Now we had the Word in human flesh. And when we had the Word in human flesh, there's no more need for the Old Testament prophets. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says this, God, who at sundry times and in diverse places and diverse manners has spoken unto us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us through his Son. That's why you cannot take a prophet and put him in the same category as the Old Testament prophet. may say, well, what about Ephesians chapter 4? He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors. Yeah, but that's a different prophet. It's a thus saith the Holy Ghost. Because now the Holy Spirit was, Jesus said, I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. And he shall speak, but he will not speak of himself, but that which he hears, he shall speak unto you. So now we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Ghost, and when we listen to the Holy Spirit, we are speaking what the Holy Spirit says. Follow me? And so Agabus is doing exactly that same thing. He's saying, thus saith the Holy Ghost, 
so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things both, we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, there's nothing wrong with them wanting that. But they were actually fighting against the will of God. They didn't, want to, they didn't want Paul. They didn't want Paul to be gone. They wanted him to be around. They wanted him to teach more. They wanted to, to you know, fellowship with him. They wanted to be with him. And they were trying to persuade him. But they just got a message from the Holy Ghost. And no matter, sometimes you know, people say, well, if we pray and fast, you know, maybe God will change us. Those are on non-essential things, yes. But when God has determined the decree, to give an example, there's coming a time when the Antichrist will come. And no fasting and prayer is going to stop that. Because that decree has to happen in order for the other things to happen, in order for Christ to come back. So there are, there are things that God has decreed that are, gonna, that are absolutely, positively going to happen. And no fasting and prayer is going to change that. Because if it's truth, then he's changing his word. And his word is true. Then Paul answered. Now, understand this. This is a situation. You kind of find Paul in the situation. This is a very emotional time. These people are hanging on to him and crying, oh, Paul, please don't go. Please don't go, man. We love you. You're, you're our brother. You know, Don't go. We, we need you here. The church needs you. You know, like you said, these wolves are going to come in and everything's going to happen. Why don't you just stay with us? You know, it'd, be, it'd be far better for you if you stayed with us than you go there. I mean, what good is it going to be if you're dead and in the ground? Think about it. They start to use reason. And a lot of times we can use reason over and, and actually nullify the will of God through reason. Amen. Sometimes, you know, when things happen in our life, when we think about things, you know, like you're driving somewhere and you've got some place to go and you're in a hurry, and all of a sudden God says, no, stop for that person. Yeah, but I'm in a hurry. You start to reason. You can actually talk yourself out of the will of God. And just think of, you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the story, too, of, of Rebecca when she stopped for Milan to help her with her groceries. If she didn't do that, Milan and Elouge would not be here today. I'm sure she was busy. I'm sure she was going somewhere. I'm sure she just didn't get in her car and go for a ride looking for two uh, na uh, Haitian people uh, or a Haitian woman walking down the street with, with bags. No, she was going somewhere. She had a destination. She had a purpose. But what happened was is that the Holy Spirit quickened her to do something, his will, to give her a hand. And she didn't reason it saying, well, I just don't have time. I've got to be at that other place. She put that aside and said, to listen to the Holy Ghost. You follow me? She didn't let reasoning talk her out of it. You know, sometimes you, you feel like God wants you to give a track to someone. Don't let, don't let the enemy talk you out of it. That may be that person's last chance of salvation. That's how, that's how critical it can be. That could be the last chance that person ever had to have the gospel. So then Paul answered, and he says, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? So there was some emotional pressure going on here. Okay, they were, they were really pressing Paul here. You know, they were like, you know, come on. Come on, Jeanette, stay. Don't leave. Come on. We love you. We don't want you to go. Yeah, you know, but think about that pressure. I mean, Paul was human too. I would be better off if I could still write and I could still maybe reach a few more churches, a few more people. 
you know, and I'm sure the devil threw all these thoughts in his mind and stuff like that. But there was a great emotional pull. But when you're when you're focused and you're called in ministry, you've got to do what God's called you to do. I can't begin to tell you how many times Brother Diamond told me, Linda and I, come on down in Baton Rouge. We're restarting the church up. You know, your temperament and my temperament, we get along great. You know, you're a teacher. We, I mean, you're a pastor. You know, we can really, we can really minister together. That would have been a great opportunity. But guess what? I can't just do that. Some pastors just do that. A greater opportunity comes around. You know, if someone came to me and, uh, you know, I guess I could probably, I don't know if I wanted to candidate for the church in Phoenix because, you know, Pastor Groven is getting older and we both have a missionary heart. We have a missionary mind. You know, we're both missionary oriented. Um, and uh, I guess I could candidate for it if I told them I was interested. But I can't because I'm not in it for the money. I'm not in it for the large crowds. I'm not in it for, for those things. I'm in it because God called me to it. And until and if God ever did release me, then I could go. But until he does, I cannot go. It's not my choice. He's got me here. Amen? I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And it's, at times it's disheartening because I like to see us grow more and I like to see more solid Christians coming in, you know, as, as we have some here, but more solid Christians coming in and more workers and we can do more and more finances and we can do more. But you know what? God knows all that. And I'm happy that I could be in used as an instrument in your lives to impart something to you. So when I depart, guess what? I may die physically, but I'm with you always. I'm, I'm going to be a part of you. You're going to always remember the words that I've spoken. Oh, I remember the pastor, he was so funny, he did this. I remember the pastor teaching us this. You know, look at how I was telling the pastor today what he was doing. You know, wow, that's awesome. It's like Paul is with us always. Look. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul, his words are with us. Okay? So praise God. He says, why are you breaking my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem. I'm ready. I'm ready because, not because I'm old. Not because my body's worn out. No. I'm ready because this is God's will. And whatever God's will is for my life, I'm ready. He didn't have to get ready. He was ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? He said, well, I am ready not to be bound only, to be in prison, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm, I'm willing to do it for him. If that's, what it, if that's what it's called to be, and that's what I've got to do, then I'm doing it. And verse 14 says, And when he would not be persuaded. So there was some, there was some, uh, some definite dialogue going on. There was some definite convincing trying to be convincing to go on. But when you're determined, and I like what Pastor Norman Noriga said to me one time uh, in a letter that when I received my honorary doctorate. He was my very first pastor. And in the letter he stated something that goes like this. I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase a little bit. He said, um, he has proven his call by sticking it out all these years in a very tough area. And it's true. Many have given up. Many have tried the five-year plan, what I call you know, the five-year plan. You go for five years, if nothing develops and nothing takes off and you're not a big shot, guess what? You go somewhere else. Well, what happened to the call? 
thought you were called. I thought that this church that you started was the call. Then why are you, why are you leaving? Why are you shutting it down? Why are you going there? If this is the call, God called you to do this, now all of a sudden God changed his mind? No. Are you handed over to somebody else? Because you've got to offer to pastor a 500-member church now? No, you're just going there because you're going to get more money and you're going to have more prestige and more people. Be honest. Timothy, when he was called to pastor, he pastored Ephesus for 30, over 30 years. Brother Grosvenor, he's been at that church for 56 years as the pastor. Dan Mariano was in his church over 40-something years, almost 50 years, in the same church, through highs and lows and attendance and no attendance and low attendance and high attendance, all of those things. Why? Because they're called. Churches that I've heard of and, and, and you know I've heard testimony about started in New Jersey. Started with a very few people. Within three, four years, they had 5,000 people. 5,000 people is a lot of people. So they built a school. They built a high school. They built everything. And then two years later, guess what? Pastor fell into sin. It got sold in the real estate market. It's no longer a church anymore. Where's the call? You have to beware for the wolves. You have to beware for the wolves. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, look at this, the will of the Lord be done. So apparently, somehow, they were thinking that maybe what they were telling him was the will of God. But when you have that determining factor, that you know, 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 that this is the will of God, nothing can sway you. I, I, I just want to say this. I remember when Annie came to, first came to the church. She walked in the door, sat down, and God said, that is your pastor. And she said, but Lord, I think she's all that, but Lord, like God don't know, but Lord, I don't even know. Okay. She didn't know what I believed, but she already knew what God said. And I think, the, I think what I believe is okay then. And then you see the restoration of her family. You see the restoration of her husband. You see all the things that take place. All because she was obedient. We don't know if Pastor Tom would have been back with the Lord if it wasn't for the Pentecostal fire. We don't know if Rebecca and Bobby would, would be married and be together today if I had not stepped into that cafeteria. Amen. Because that's how God does it. And so we, they said, you know, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with all, us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manson of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there because I don't want to go into the next, where Paul begins to um, arrive in Jerusalem. There's a lot there we want to talk about. But um, there's a lot of meat here. There's a lot of good stuff here. And do um, you have any questions tonight? Any questions? What a crowd. Um, we're so glad that you know what you know, that you believe what you believe. Know the will of God for your life. There's nothing like the will of God. Just think about it. You don't need one of those figure eight balls, you know, those, uh, one of those uh, what is it, eight balls. You don't need to shake it and find out what your future is. You don't need to go to a fortune teller. 
Okay, because they don't know anyway. Okay, and what they tell you only comes to pass because the devil's trying to make it come to pass so you can believe that lie. Only God knows the future. And so you know the best thing to do is just trust him day by day. Walk in him. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And be strong in him. And allow his grace to encourage you and to lift you up and to build you up. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you tonight. God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And thank you for the Apostle Paul who paid the ultimate price. That, Father, we have two-thirds of the New Testament attributed to him because, Lord, he was in those places. He was in those prisons. And it's not like the prisons today with cable TV and heat and, and, and you know, nice meals. He was in these caves with running water, you know, flowing through the cave from the rain and, and the mold and the, and the dirt and the uh, cement and slab to lay on. And just think of the, his bones and, and all of the things that he went through. Father, thank you for that man that paid the price. Thank you for Luke who wrote the book of Acts. Thank you, Father, for what you're teaching us from this book, that it's not just coming to Bible study just because it's a religious thing, but Father, you're teaching us, and I, I thank you for Sister Linda in Maine, and I thank you, Father, that she's learning so much and she's growing so much, and I appreciate her comments when she makes comments on Facebook. Father, I pray that you bless her, Lord, and that, Father, you make her strong in the faith, O oh God, and that she would lead many people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, even in her family, God. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, and thank you for all that you're doing and all you're doing in this church. I thank you for each and every one that came out tonight, Father, and those that didn't come out, Father, for whatever reason, Lord, be with them, and strengthen them, and encourage them tonight. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. God bless you.